So today what I'd like to do is talk about the work of our firm, Iwamoto Scott. I am the Iwamoto, and this is the Scott, Craig Scott, <laughs> right here, <laughs> although he won't be speaking. And we are a fairly small firm. We're only 10 people or so. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Um, but even though we're small, we try to do a range of projects. So we do anything from a very small installation, some maybe the size of this table, to buildings and interiors, to speculations that maybe look at an entire urban region. Um, and we try to keep the range of this wide range of work in our firm so that we can look at different aspects of really the architectural and urban project. Um, for today, what I'd like to focus on more specifically, because I know that um, with Tamako and people are interested in digital fabrication, is to talk a little bit about the way the computational work and digital work in our firm translates through the different um, scales of the projects that we work on. So for example, with the installations, we're really looking at material behavior um, and investigating new ways to um, write scripts or work on um, digital media. Uh, with the buildings and interiors, the, it's really more about communication. So how do we, because we are not actually building our own work at that scale, so how can we communicate to contractors and the builders who might be a little bit less familiar with some of the geometries and forms that we're interested in? And then lastly, the speculations. And here, really, because these are not built, um, we're looking more at a kind of indeterminacy or um, how can we develop some kind of parametric process to allow for different outcomes which are not necessarily predictable. Um, okay, so I'm going to just go through some of the projects. Oh, now that feels very loud. I'm gonna go through not all of these projects because it would, we would be here a very long time, um, but some, some projects from every uh, section. So first talking about installations. One of the things that we're very interested in terms of installations is how to think about um, making structure through very thin materials. So trying to find things, when you think about the building industry, here, okay, here in Buenos Aires you have concrete. We don't work that much in concrete. We tend to work more in thin sheets of plywood or other kind of wood materials, um, cement board panels and things like that. So one of the things we're interested in is how do we take thin things and make them structural through specifically folding. Um, that work can take on many different scales. One of the things that we looked at very early on is a simple operable screen. And so just to start putting our heads around and minds around how to think about folding, we first developed this very simple project that we call in and out curtain. Basically the curtain is something that we wanted to deform and flex when someone was able to touch it. And so we developed a single module that could hold two positions, one that we called in and one that we called out. And in that way, the whole curtain could take on a different, um, a, a different form at different times based on how the modules, individual modules were behaving. Um, this was also a lesson for us in terms of connections and um, integrating the different pieces to each other where in this early prototype, for example, we had simple you know, kind of uh, fasteners and later we began to fold the pieces together. And so it was also an, a way that we started to think about how the folding could um, create the connective device as well as the module. Um, we also, during this very little project, discovered this very interesting material, which is a wood laminate material. And that wood laminate material is put on a, a paper product. And because it's on this paper product, we're able to fold it without breaking it. And so we learned many things from this very simple exercise. Um, that we carried on into subsequent work. So this is a, a very small um, installation. It's only maybe the, you know, the size of this table. It's half scale, so it was meant to hold a human body. And here what we were looking at is taking that same very, very thin material, but instead of making it flexible, thinking about how it could be made structural. So in this case, we were um, inspired, for example, by the work of Antony Gormley, which has the um, figure, which is very literal at the interior, but is made very abstract 
at its edges. And so we wanted to do something a little bit similar mm -hmm. where on the interior of this rest box, and this, by the way, was for an exhibition in Guangzhou in uh, Korea. Um, and the interior of this box could be a seat or maybe a lounge, a place where a person could sit. And the profile of this would be more literal. But as the, um, the way that it's fabricated and assembled, by the time you get to the exterior, it becomes something more abstract. So the human body is still present in a way at the exterior, but in a, in a very different kind of way. This was also a case in terms of the digital fabrication where we, again, learned from the previous project. And here is sort of um, a hybrid, a mixture of a couple different ways of putting things together. It is a project that's partly about sectioning meaning we are sectioning, but in a radial way. And it's also a project a bit about waffling because we are connecting in, in two and three dimensions. And it's also a project about folding because here we are folding the pieces together to make these blocks. Rather than, this is an example of the blocks. <laughs> However, the blocks are not made independently like this. They're made through a series of a number of pieces. So each block is made actually of three sheets um, of material. So this is the interior. Um, again, it was built at half scale, so a bit smaller. Um, but, but it becomes quite strong and rigid. And it was um, interesting us, for us to figure out how to make something which is normally supple and flexible um, into something rigid. And here again, begin to see the abstraction of the pattern at the exterior of the box because of the way that it's cut um, of the, the original idea of the human figure being nested within. We also do this kind of work. So sometimes um, in our practice, what we do is we work on um, a slightly bigger project. This is just for this lobby um, uh, in a, high, a small high rise downtown San Francisco, where a contractor will build uh, a good portion of the work. So for example, the, the builder will build these kinds of pieces, but we will build something which the contractor um, does not know how to make, essentially. or they think of it not a, more like an art installation, um, in a sense. So here, what we were, uh, we wanted to explore a different dimension of the material, and here, what we were uh, interested in is the dimension of translucency, and the fact that it could transmit l light. So this is a wood product, mm -hmm. however, it glows when there's some light inside of it. Um, so we made this ceiling chandelier, in a sense, a large. Um, coffered ceiling, which also spoke to the rest of the building, which had a number of historical coffers um, inside of it. And then the rest of the lobby becomes um, a kind of bigger scale of that in a way, and uses light in a slightly different manner. So here the light, we're more interested in the glowing interior. Here the light more this kind of seeping out between our new liner and the, and the building which we were given. So everything in white was already there uh, in this project. This whole space is essentially a lobby to get you from the front door to the elevators that you don't see in the back. And so it was important to lead someone through um, the space in a kind of um, that made sense to them. When it, so this is the coffers with the light off. And, and we enjoyed how this material looks just like wood. It looks just like this wood, actually, when there's not light behind it. It's only when the light comes emanates from the interior that one begins to understand that it's not just um, a regular piece of um, wood material. We'd also learned from previous projects that we could make the um, structure our pieces without any mechanical fasteners. And so because we had done the work on the Guangzhou with the big folded pieces, here we did the folded as a detail, but we could rigidify, make uh, rigid all our edges through just simple folds, almost like making clothes, rigid clothes um, is how we thought about it. And, this, and, and the project itself, the form of it is very simple. It's just cut, a, you know, a, it's a form which is cut underneath so that we have different angles for the way light, light emanates from the bottom. Um, and then it has a couple different ways that one can understand it. But it certainly it looks like a, we think like a pineapple, <laughs> um, you know, like from, from the back. Um, whereas from the front, it just feels more like the singular pieces. And then our... our more ambitious project, or the biggest project, using this material, 
was a project that we had done at the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles. This is a very interesting gallery. It's part of a, a school of architecture that some of you may be familiar with. And they have a gallery space. It's actually about the size of this room, um, but it's flat. And maybe three or four times a year, they have different uh, architects come to do an installation here. So you work together with students. You teach a class, sometimes in the summer, sometimes it's during the school year. But uh, Craig and I would teach a class there, and then as part of the class, we in our office would design this piece, but the students would be able to help fabricate and install it. So this is a project where we, where we wanted to, again, push the boundaries of the things that we had already understood about the material. One of the things that we understood was that you could fold it. The other thing that we understood is that um, it was translucent. We wanted to think about these two things to make a much larger structure in space. The other thing that we brought, um, which was our interest, a separate interest, but we brought it into this project, is what, is, what does it mean to fold along a curved seam? So you, it becomes a very different kind of geometry. I think one of the things that, um, and it becomes quite beautiful. So this is just a little piece of uh, paper, but when you cut it along a curved seam, it obviously deforms in plan, but also deforms in section. So it begins to have this other kind of cupping, this dishing to it. And we wanted to explore the relationship, essentially, of this new geometry that one can make by a very simple cut and a very simple fold and the larger installation. There, is, um, there are documents and, and um, mathematic, Toussaint probably knows this, but <laughs> mathematical formulas that look at the relationship of curved folding to geometry. I have to say that it was very complex for us, and one of the most difficult things about this project, because oftentimes in our, in our practice, we begin with, with the material itself. We don't actually begin in the computer um, for installations in any case. So the most difficult thing in this case was how do we take something which we know is happening physically and translate it digitally so that the, the computer can understand it um, and be able to um, make the array of parts that we, we need to make this very large surface. Uh, so we did a number of trials and tests. What these tests show, some of these things, some of these models, these, mo these two models here and these two models here, were just done by hand. We did not have any um, idea, really, of what form the overall pieces would take when we assembled them together. Um, we did begin to discover that it would have this overall kind of arched or vaulted form to it. These studies here and, and these studies here were the um, process that we went through, the iter iterative process that we went through to try to discover the relationship of the physical to the digital. So here, for example, we have too, st too strong of a fillet, too small of a fillet that for, makes a crease that we don't want. So part of what we needed to dis discover is what kind of curvature were we actually trying to create and how could we draw that line? How would the, the program know how to draw that line to the right diameter, essentially? The other thing that we needed to discover is because it's folding not just in plan but in section, the module, when you fold it, gets a little smaller. So it needed to fit in a room exactly, but once it's folded together and takes on a form, we needed to know how big the whole piece would be. So what we did is we made a little flat piece, and we, we felt that if this overall dimension was the same, that, that, we, that we could predict it based on this curvature, then we felt like if we added hundreds more, it would still be the same, and we would be able to predict then how it could fit into the room. So this is describing our successful example of where we took the module and it's folded on three sides and we knew that it would be this big and it also stays flat. So now we can control the geometry between the curvature in plan and section and the overall curvature when they're put together. And that is what then the, the Rhino script was written for. Um, okay, so then we also in the office do large scale mock-ups. Um, this one is just out of a chipboard material, a cardboard material. Um, it fails, right? Because there, the 
connections are too weak. They just, so there's things wrong with the edges. We need more support here. And so these are things that we just do sort of um, early <laughs> so we don't have the mistakes later on, essentially. Um, okay, so this describes some of the process, the digital process, so, uh, and the material process, really. So what, what we had realized from the early models is that the, um, the overall form became a vault. In that vault, there's different ways that the um, forces align. This is the middle of the vault, and these are the edges. We need more pieces and smaller pieces here because this is where it needs to be stronger. We also realized we needed sort of a continuous element that moves along the edge so that we don't have the problem of the, of the breaking edge and things like that um, for the overall piece. And then the module itself is made by first understanding the curvature and section and in plan, um, developing the flanges, and then unrolling the flanges so that um, it can be cut with the laser cutter. And then the Rhino script is something which packs these, packs these different modules together. So it, ne it needs to understand the overall tessellation, whether the module is next to another module, or whether it's free-floating, or whether it's next to two modules, or whether it's next to three modules. And in each case, the computer could understand that so that it could be folded with a flat or that it would draw in the curved fold and be able to fold the curved seam. And so once that was automated, once you give it this tessellation, it does everything else for you. It, it's automatic. Um, and it also unfolds it. Um, the other thing that we discovered is that wood, no matter how thin it is, because the wood is it's like this, it's so thin, it's very stubborn material. It has a grain, and it wants to do certain things, and it doesn't want to do other things. And no matter what you tell it, it will do what it wants to do. So what we realized was we needed to organize the modules on the sheet, the large sheet for the laser cutting, in such a way that the grain was either parallel to the straight side or parallel to the long side of the module. And that also needed was part of the script that could place these in such a way that was very efficient, but also would rotate them on the, with the wood grain so that they were facing the right direction. Um, it was only at this time, I want to say that it took this long. We had maybe been working on the project for two months um, before we really understood the conceptual, what we wanted to do conceptually. And that sometimes happens in our firm. We, we just are, we're experimental like Tamako. We just do stuff. And then it only becomes clear later what the concept is. And in this case, the concept became much more about not only the, the process and the overall form making, but also the, a, structural, a structural relationship. This structural relationship, I think many of you probably already uh, know this, um, is that the catenary form is something which is very pure structurally. A catenary um, arch is a pure compressive um, structure. A catenary chain is a pure tension structure. What we were interested in is thinking about how to fold these two things together. And so essentially, we have a very thin compressive element that would, in a way, question the heaviness of a typical vault and conflate that with the thinness of a chain. Um, we also worked with a structural engineer uh, in Los Angeles who did these hanging chain models for us. Like if you think of um, Gaudi, Antonio Gaudi or Fry Otto, they, do, they did these physical hanging chain models that could, that, you know, would um, uh, regularize the form so that they they were in more pure tension. Um, they did this work for us, and they also could do a stress analysis. So here you can see that there's more stress at the columns and the seams, and less stress at the top. And that actually became our strategy for how big the modules could be. They could be bigger and more porous at the top, and more tight and dense at the bottom. This shows a comparison of two different surfaces. The initial surface that we gave them and then the surface that they, they got from that hanging chain model. So they're very similar, and yet they were able to reduce the stresses uh, by half. Um, and then this was the surface. This is the tessellation pattern with the porosity. Uh, and then the script put in, puts in all the pieces for us. This is the working drawing. This is the drawing that describes basically what you do first. Again, students made this at SciArc, but these, these happen together. 
these happen together, and then the pieces, the light pieces, get infilled after. So this describes us building it a little bit. Um, we wanted to fill the gallery space, so again, we needed to really be accurate about how these, um, the overall geometries changed, but it did fit, which was good. Um, show some of the students building it. Again, building it so that these columns happen first and then kind of filling in the center later. Um, and we couldn't go back. It wasn't strong enough to walk on, so we had to get it. We kind of worked from one side over to the other side of the gallery. Uh, nearing completion, and then really simple attachments, just zip tied together. And this is a project from above. So above, um, SciArc has this walkway, and you can see the, the piece as a whole. So we wanted it to fill the gallery. We were not interested in doing an object that was just sitting in the middle of the room. We wanted it to really fill the whole room. Uh, and then underneath. And here we're able, we're able to take advantage of the light um, in the space and get that gl more glowing quality in the shadows that the uh, porous surface creates. This is giving just some sense of the scale, and this is when it first opened. Uh, and then the light quality coming through. When there's not light behind, it's quite interesting because, um, and here you can see the geometry of the curve that the curve seam creates, um, and also the orientation of the, of the wood. Um, we, feel, we, we feel like the project is, um, to us, really interesting because it has this quality of the solid block, of the voussoir, the stone, um, sometimes. But other times when the light comes through, then it reveals that it's actually this very, very thin membrane. Um, so it's, again, trying to question the materiality um, of the piece overall. Okay. In terms of um, some bigger scale work, so those were some installations. We've taken some of that knowledge and translated it into some of our larger scale work. Um, one of those examples, maybe the most direct translation, is for the Miami Design District City Garage. Um, for this project, it was this very big building. This, maybe some of you have been to Miami, but this is right along a freeway, and, and it's in the design district. So the design district is a new district of Miami. Um, and they, and every, every building is designed by some architect. Um, this building was a big parking garage, and we wanted to do this whole parking garage, but the client said, no, you can only do this much of this parking garage. <laughs> um, and then other artists and another architect did the other pieces. They wanted, because it was so large, they wanted it to look like three different buildings. But it's very, again, very visible from the freeway. So we were only really responsible for this little edge, this edge of the facade of the parking, the edge of the stair, and then this um, facade for the small little office building. And this is a project, this was taken a little while ago, um, but it was during the, end, the tail end of the construction. And basically our strategy was to take, again, the folding and to make structural panels out of very thin aluminum. Um, and this, that's what this piece is. And then this is the stair, which is a simple perforated aluminum. Uh, and then this uh, becomes the, the facade for the office, which again, very simple, just slab. But taking the idea of the chevron <laughs> and the crease um, and just doing it at a different scale. So this is the crease just at a different scale. But very simple, just very simple you know, curtain wall system um, on slabs, which have a different point um, throughout. Again, we still do mock-ups in our office, um, and, then, and then we worked here with the fabricator who began to model the project um, more rigorously with the actual dimensions of the parking garage. It's actually a hybrid structure where it's partially the panel that spans across the floor plate the panel span in this kind of zone, and then these cantilever up and down from the slabs. We were also responsible for the um, amount of air that could circulate through the parking garage, and so we developed five different types of panels. These are the most open, these are the most closed, and then on every level, we needed a, a mix of these, and so that we had enough cir air circulation, natural air circulation, um, through the parking garage describing it a little bit in construction and the kind of drawings that we would do to communicate that came from our digital model. Again, the um, struts coming up and down, and then the panels being assembled. And this shows the project and the two other facades you can see here um, next to it. 
One of, one of our goals was that, as with all our projects actually, is that the final result um, has maybe some unexpected qualities. In this case, the unexpected qualities came from the shadow and the light. We thought of it more like this kind of brush stroke or mural across the building um, that would change with the light um, and the sun and from day to night. So this describes it a little bit in the evening. And then just the different ways that the panels look under different views. Um, oh, the other thing about this project I might add is that we only had, uh, between the end of the structure and the property line, we only had maybe this much space. So we wanted it to feel very three-dimensional even though we only had this much space to work in. And so the structure took this much space. So we really only had this much space <laughs> in order to make it feel very three-dimensional. And so the folding of the panels allows it to read three-dimensionally, even though it's still quite flat. Uh, here you can see how it's a little bit more flat around the curve. And then again, looks very different depending on the way you look at it. Um, OK. Um, how much time do I have? I'm time, OK. I have, OK. <laughs> I'm just making sure. Um, we also did, maybe you know Bloomberg, they had the Bloomberg Media, um, they're also a technology company. This is an interior project, I'll talk about two interior projects and then a couple speculative projects. So this interior project was interesting, it was in this beautiful building downtown, Art Deco building, and it had this, a lot of ornamentation like this and a lot of um, shadow and relief also at the base. We were working on two of the upper floors. Our, our design strategy here, because the existing building was very beautiful already inside. It had raw concrete and brick and things that the client really liked. So here the strategy was to make these liners that would kind of um, just add one more layer to the space sometimes, kind of like this room, like right? there's like one more layer into an existing space. As well as some punctuated moments, um, this is a becomes a kind of brand moment for the company with some data. And then the company also has a fish tank in every office. And so this one has a tank made of, um, it has little rays, stingrays inside. Um, here the piece that really um, we needed the digital fabrication and the computational understanding for was this ceiling piece. So the ceiling is an, an adaptation. It's a translation of the, the Art Deco chevron on the exterior brought into the interior. Um, it does have um, a different uh, boundary conditions, however, and so each piece is unique um, and not the same. And we needed to then model it in order for us to be able to tell the carpenter how to make um, each one uh, because each one was, in fact, different. This just describes a little bit of the sectioning through. So it starts from a point, a single triangle, and ends at a rectangle. And it's essentially a very simple loft between those two um, end conditions. This describes some of the kind of templates we would make to um, show the different pieces um, for the carpenter. Um, and then the overall plan, uh, describing some of the fabrication process and the installation in space. And again, we were interested very much like the previous work on how to create something that felt very three-dimensional and something that was actually quite shallow. Some of the space is finished overall. And one of the things I might mention about tech offices in general, we do a number of tech offices, is they have many social spaces inside the tech office. So this is the pantry. This is where people get their food and have the, get the espresso, spend their tea time, uh, and also do some work um, in the off hours. So this piece becomes a liner that also has poche that holds program, like the seating. Uh, and through this is where you see the chevron. Um, of the window outside, and it becomes a passageway to this multifunctioning space in the back. And everything, everything in here, this all this whole side, all the equipment is embedded into the walls. And it stretches over the guard desk here. Then we also did this other piece, um, which is again the stingray tank, the tank for the little sharks, and um, this light volume. So this light volume is actually made of steel, and this is another case where we were able to model it. It was quite complex because what happened was is the client originally wanted a stair here, and we cut the hole for the stair in the concrete, and then they decided they didn't want a stair there. <laughs> 
So we already had the hole and we needed to put something in it. Um, and, but we also had this fish tank and it already had its form also. So we needed to somehow um, mediate between the hole in the floor and the fish tank. And that is what this light volume became. And we needed to, that to be very precise because these were already done and the hole was already there. Um, and so again, just being able to model it digitally very precisely to give information to the contractor um, so they, they could water jet cut the steel parts exactly. Um, and so it's also a piece that has this inner liner. This inner liner has LED behind it and this kind of diffusion layer. And what the LEDs are portraying is, a, is data, data from the company, which is abstracted. And so it becomes like an art piece, which is describing the data from Bloomberg. Um, and it becomes a work bar above also, um, as well as you can look down and then see the little stingrays and get some access to the first floor. And then this exterior changes. It's an, it, it's an animated cycle. And we also recently completed the Pinterest headquarters. This is, do you, I don't know how many people, do you know Pinterest here? Okay, yeah, they're, they're a fabulous company. Um, I love them. <laughs> they took over this whole building and we're doing a different, a new, they already when we finish this one, we're doing another interior also. Um, but it was this existing building, it was a factory. Um, and, it, and it was changed over time, not necessarily in a good way, but it already had you know, all the concrete. It already had this light well in the middle um, and this atrium in the middle. So what we chose to do for the design is to cut the atrium down a little further to the first floor because there's only light on this side of the building and on this side of the building. So there's not a lot of light in the middle. So we needed to use these skylights and we cut this additional hole in the floor um, to be able to bring the light down. And then we inserted this um, sculptural stair and the sculptural stair helps to diffuse the light also. Again, with the technology companies, they really spoil their employees. Um, they provide them lunch, they provide them breakfast, they provide them dinner, they have places for the bikes, they have showers, they have, they have everything that you could want. Um, so the eating is a big portion of the program. So the ground floor includes a big dining area and they also use this for meetings, meetings for the whole company. Um, and then around this stair is where the whole kitchen and the service kind of zone is. We also created this waffle ceiling, which sits over the front. Um, there was actually a also another company in this building, but um, what we wanted to define is how it really uh, was more of a Pinterest identity by having something travel across the whole front. So here we created this large waffle ceiling. Um, and it incorporates the mechanical, and it has the sprinklers, and, and it has lighting also up inside. Oh, you can see some of the glowing lighting. And then here at the end is the barista. They have coffee, <laughs> um, as well as lounge spaces for all the employees. So this is entering the project. And now, this is right when it was completed. Now it's full, so many people. People are always sitting in all of these spaces. Um, so this is kind of the front lounge defined by that waffle ceiling. Um, this uh, a kind of just diagonal waffle that had to be quite carefully made also because it needed to avoid all these columns. Um, and this was a very irregular building. The whole building sloped like half a meter from one side to the other because it had settled over time. Um, and then this is looking into what they call the all hand space. So this is a large dining commissary space and then you can see here the stair in the distance. Um, and so the stair really really becomes the heart of the project and around that is where they serve the food and they have the snack um, and where they work with IT and technology. Um, and the stair itself is something which is quite sculptural. It's a volume that has embedded with lights and so at night it emanates light. Uh, in the day it diffuses the light through the space. Um, this is kind of wrapping around. This is a servery area. You're always seeing the stair. At the back, again, more service. This is the IT lounge. Um, and then looking back towards the dining area. The stair is hanging from the floor above. And then just touching here. Not really supported so much here. It's also, the stair is also meant to be a social space where people could meet 
Um, it also has um, some brand identity in that the company is very interested. This is looking at lunchtime. The company is very interested in the concept of knitting. They think about knitting people together, knitting people together in the company, and then, of course, knitting people together on the platform um, of the website. And so the stare we saw is a volume, volumetric knitting, where we have this kind of void, and it self-intersects. The stare intersects itself. Um, this is it from above. I'll show you. It actually intersects itself. It's, I will show you a better picture of this, but it intersects itself so that you can see from this run of stare down to this run of stare. And this is like looking through. This is where it's intersecting on itself. And then it's clad with the perforated metal on the inside and the outside. And then it kind of rises up to the second floor. And again, forms a social space of the interior. Just the, some of the rest of the floor plan, I don't want to go into this in too much detail other than to say that we wanted transparency, um, limited transparency, strategic tra transparency between the center and the edges where the people were working. And we did that by creating these glass corners. And the glass corners cut through the meeting spaces so that this is a meeting room and this is a meeting room but this is an open lounge and that is an open workspace and the glass corner you're allowed to see across diagonally. Or sometimes from room to room and sometimes from open lounge to open workspace. And so this concept of the intersection was something that played out not just in the stair but also throughout the whole space. They have ping pong tables, they, ha they have everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then a slightly different project, just I wanted to show it because it's a little bit like the Pinterest project volumetrically, um, and it's a little bit complex geometrically in part of the roof, which we needed the uh, computation for, or the translation, again, through digital means. Um, this is a single-family house, very small, not very small, um, 200 square meters, um, um, but a very big piece of land, a 95-acre piece of land, and beautiful views all the way around. So here, the idea was that the house would be this object in the round, and it could have views to every different direction. Um, uh, it's it's an asymmetrical hexagon based on the pro interior program and also the views that one is able to look out at. Um, we cut a courtyard in the middle, so it has a rhombus-shaped courtyard on the exterior and a hexagonal exterior. Um, and then it captures the water. It can be dry in California, so the roof is a water collector also, and the water can come down to the courtyard for, to collect the water. Um, and then the, the, the plinth uh, lifts off the ground. The foundation lifts off the ground. Um, and then we carved in the courtyards for these outside terraces and decks, which would then have access again to the view. And this is sort of the geometry of the project overall. It seems a little bit complex because each of these sides is different. However, on the interior, the inside space, everything is actually a very simple uh, rectilinear volume. Um, and it's the open terraces that take up the different geometry of the site. This is the design Craig came up with. He woke up one day and he said he dreamed the solution. We thought it was a very good solution <laughs> that it could float um, on the land. The soil is also very unstable here. It's what they call heaving soils. And so the whole building sits kind of like a ship on the ground. Um, it does not have piles that cut into the ground. Um, and then this is describing the structure from up above and again conveying to the contractor just the, um, the lengths of these pieces so that it could be uh, uh, each piece, because they're different, could be cut at their correct length. A, a bird's eye view from up on a hill nearby. This is the garage. One, one interesting thing about this project is it has no, it's not connected to any um, electrical grid or no water grid. Everything is coming just from the site. So this is solar panels, and the garage is like a little battery in a way that powers the house. So the solar powers the house, and then there are cisterns that are down on the hill um, that capture the rainwater and make and filter the water, and that's how. And there's a creek. There's some under 
underground creeks that the water goes to the cistern to get and is filtered. So this is completely independent, um, the functioning of the space. It has great views out to this lake, Lake Berryessa. This was actually during the drought, so it looks even better now. And these are some photos just in construction. The garage with the house um, and the house and it's floating. We also did things like um, when we got these, uh, these uh, cedar planks, they came in all different lengths. We cataloged those lengths and we could, we could then say where we wanted it to go. Um, so that we didn't have a seams, essentially. And that's something that we just did with an Excel spreadsheet and a little model. Um, because even something simple like this, it was useful for us to use that digital tool to be able to make sure we had the boards where we wanted them to be. Um, and then it's a simple steel cladding. Again, some just of the shots in construction. And the interior rhombus courtyard void. Uh, and which is, has a circulation traveling around to the different rooms. And then every time you look, you can see something a little bit different outside. Let me see if I have one. Yeah, here. Um, looking out, uh, this is my dog, um, through this room. And just always having a, a framed view of, of the landscape, as well as more um, larger views. This is the living room. They have not moved in at this point. This is the kitchen. Uh, and then the, the big window out to the lake. OK, speculations. I just have two last projects, and they'll go fairly quickly. Um, so here we use computation in a really different way. It's not really about communication <laughs> to a contractor. It's not about uh, fabrication. It's really about design process. Um, the two projects I want to show, one is a speculative building in New York, and the other is a speculative urban, kind of temporary urban plan. For Edgar Street Towers, we were invited um, by uh, Architecture Research Office, which is an arch architecture office in New York, who was replanning this area down by Wall Street called Greenwich South, or they, that's what they called it at the time, until the neighbors didn't like it, and then they came up with some other name. And they asked us to design this tower, the centerpiece um, in the middle. It's right by the World Trade Center, incidentally. And they thought we should go just a little higher than the World Trade Center. <laughs> Um, we discovered it's also on axis with Fifth Avenue and a number of the cultural institutions along that street, that spine. And this is where we use Grasshopper, um, which is the Rhino plugin, to be able to quickly come up with different um, permutations of our concept. So the concept was because we were trying to straddle, be on both sides of the street um, at the base and allow for east west communication, walking but we wanted to align with Fifth Avenue in the perpendicular way at the top. We wanted basically the tower would twist from an east-west direction to a north-south direction up above, um, and then it needed to bind itself back together again. And so what the script did is really begin to study where, how and when the twist happened. And this shows a number of permutations, and we could just look at it very quickly. But essentially, from these simple volumes, it would rotate the pieces and then it could do it in any number of locations, bind it together again, and then cut, shear off the building with the zoning envelope, which is this envelope. And we could do that very quickly and basically look and see which one we think thought worked the best you know, for the scale of the building and the scale of the street and the scale of the axis up above. We also use the you know, computation to develop a facade system that would have different kinds of um, amounts of opening based on the orientation to the sun. So this is describing the project in the city and looking up, more porous at the base, some structural idea there too, and then um, more solid at the top. And then the bottom piece here curves. It's a very interesting site, but it curves around the um, exit of the, an entrance to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel down at grade. And then this is the east-west connection through um, and then the north-south connection at the top. Um, and then the last project, we were invited by a, a large technology company to um, think about an instant city. So these big technology companies, in addition to giving their employees food and all kinds of wonderful things, they also have these events. And the events include employees, but also um, the public, so developers. 
Um, and, and instead of having it in a convention center, they asked us to think about what would happen if we made it this instant city, it, like a big party, a temporary, it would be up there for maybe one week and then come down again. Um, and we spent almost uh, two years on this project, not this iteration of the project, but we had very many iterations later, which I, I'm not allowed to show, but I, I can show you this one. So it is inspired by Burning Man, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, this temporary city in the desert. Um, we were inspired by things of Burning Man, not just the overall idea of the geometry of it and the way that it comes together as an infrastructure, but also the kinds of temporary pieces that they have there. So temporary social spaces. We were interested in things like um, trailer circles, <laughs> little um, social spaces, and then as well as just camping. So what we did is we took the um, inspiration from some elements of the company to make um, the overall kind of infrastructural order, which included a diagonal and a zigzag, and these were the social spaces, and then the kind of um, camping pieces and the, that would happen between. Uh, this describes a little bit more the development. So here you're seeing like the trailer circles. Maybe there's a little swimming pool inside. This is a diagonal that would have a lot of the convention program. There might be the large keynote hall here, a big um, ex exhibition space, and things like that. Here, and then also how people would live there. So in different sized tents, they, someone could bring a mobile home, very much like Burning Man. Someone could bring a mobile home. Someone could bring a fancy tent, some we could stay in this, in this little guy, and that we developed a parametric script in order to place them around, because there was no way we could individually place every place someone, you know, every kind of um, vehicle and tent that someone would be staying in, um, in a kind of random way. And so the, the parametrics came in with, this is one example of the way that this little instant city could develop, but it could also be varied based on how the diagonal and the zigzag might um, deform. And so if these deform, everything else can go with it. So they're like attached together like a, like a tree. Um, just some renderings of how we imagine this to happen in space. So it's like an, we, it were a, we were able through this means to represent an informal urbanism, which is very difficult to represent when thinking about it, everything by hand. Um, we could, we can assign certain adjacencies. Cert every t you know, this might happen once per neighborhood. These have to be a certain distance apart. They want to be a certain distance, have a certain relationship to the zigzag. This wants to have a certain relationship to the deck. So the whole um, design is really based on relationships rather than form. Um, we imagined it really to be um, eventful and light-filled at night, which is when the parties would happen. And then it could be this like apparition almost in the desert. Um, happen spontaneously here in the middle of nowhere on a farm plot, um, maybe someplace in the city. Thank you. <laughs> I could take questions. I'm happy people can, um, it's hot and, and crowded in here, so people are welcome to go, but I'm also happy to answer any questions. Um, we always use Rhino. That, that is a technology that we use every single time. Um, but other than that, oh, we use Grasshopper. We needed Grasshopper for the parametric projects, of course. And, um, but sometimes, um, like for example, the Voussoir cloud, that was a little bit before Grasshopper was a really robust program. So in that one, we had used RhinoScript. I think if we did it today, we would use Grasshopper. So we certainly learned over time. Um, and the, the technology has gotten so much better and easier. 
So, um, and it also depends on the people in our office and what, and what they feel comfortable with and what they like. But we, those are our stable programs. And other times, yeah, other things come into it sometimes if we need it to. We always use AutoCAD too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not the designing. Uh, yeah, definitely what takes the most time for us is the iterative process. Um, the more real things become, obviously, the more iterative we make them. Because we don't, we prefer not to, even, even in the projects where we have a contractor or a builder building it, it's still quite iterative. And we, we like that, and we like to push that, because we might see a sample or a mock-up of something and it's not quite what we want and we'll actually go back and redesign it. We don't, we don't really want to hand off all our drawings and then just have someone else take it over. So I want to say that the designing, the initial concept design and the formal things um, happen really in the beginning and then we take a long time to really understand how to execute them. So I want to say the execution, the process of executing the work is very long. It's like really from right after schematic design all the way through to final construction. So that's just something that we continually go back and look at and work with others and the team and a team of, you know, builders and things like that too. Yeah. Oh, hi. Position between the, the the design and the documentation of the project and the process and the construction uh, the builders. for the builders. It's uh, the the precision between the digital model through the uh, yeah. It comes through. Okay, so that's an interest. That's a very interesting question. So, I want to give the example of the Pinterest stair project. Um, because we're doing a new project with them now, which I'm, I, I don't have here, and I, it's, it's just starting construction right now. And we also have a stair in that project, very different kind of stair. But one of the things that we learned is that we would, the, this, the first Pinterest stair project was built in an old-fashioned way. They came with a, a piece of steel, and they put the piece of steel up. And they came with another piece of steel, and they put that piece of steel up. And then, oh, the panels, which were cut in, with the water jet cutter, didn't quite fit, and they had to bend them a little differently. This is not the way to do it. <laughs> the way to do it is, which we knew, which I'm so mad at myself, because I knew that, right? <laughs> but again, I can't tell someone else how to do their work in a way. But for the stair to be perfect, we can make the stair perfect, actually. But, and then the building is imperfect. The stair, we need just tolerance. We, it would have been better to have a perfect stair, and then the building might be doing something else, and we just design this little th gasket, <laughs> this transition, transitional element. That is really the way that, that, that we're doing it now for the, for the next project with them, and we, and we think it's working much better. It also depends on the craftsmen and the people you have making it. The Bloomberg project with the ceiling, we only needed to give them these overall dimensions, and they were, they were real craftsmen. They came in, they me did as-built measurements many, many times. Um, over time, if something shifted, every stud that went in, they just made sure they measured. So when that came in, it fit perfectly. People are, I mean, I think there's a lot of research into that. I think there's a lot of research in, um, 
I, I quote streamlining unquote the process of design and building. I personally don't think that's that realistic. I feel like, you know, I feel like the material world is is unpredictable sometimes, and um, that's the beauty of it, right? I, I don't feel like a fully digitized process all the way through the whole building. I mean, people are doing it actually, right? People are going, especially a new building. We work in a lot of old buildings, so it's very different. I think a brand new building, yes, I think we've seen that. Um, but I want to say when you have humans anywhere, something will happen. <laughs> you, need to, you need to address it. And that's part of the enjoyment. <laughs> That's a good question because I think after Voussoir Cloud, um, that project is the closest to that in a way. Or, you know, the Miami Garage too. Um, people uh, would categorize our firm as biomimetic or biomorphic, but that is actually not our concern. I think, I think sometimes it can be really fascinating, but I think our, our concern is really more about geometry um, and building at a bigger scale. So sometimes we only have this something this big at our disposal. You know, this is what we, ha we, we, can, what we can handle, what we can manage in our office. Um, and we love doing the installations. At the same time, we want to, you know, moving into buildings and bigger scaled things. I think our, what we're striving to do is to, um, how can we get the kind of, um, uh, complex relationship of material to bigger space, to, bi to bigger scale. That's sort of it. Sometimes it has to do with the cell, but other times it just has to do with, you know, the site. It, it could really be many different things. In other words, I wish I had a formula, but I don't think we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. So that's a really good question also. So sometimes, um, like in Voussoir Cloud, the me method of joining it together was really easy. It was just a little bit of a plastic tie. <laughs> Other times we layer, you know, we would layer the flanges together and the joining of it um, became as much of the project, like the, even that little Guangzhou rest box, the, the, um, the, the layering of the pieces together on top of each other um, was, was really integral to the overall structure too, because then we could double the material and, and we got more internal um, rib work that way. So that is always part of the project. I think the decision of what type of fastening and connecting to use for us has to do with things like the labor. Who's helping us? Are they, do they have any experience at all? Can they do that or is it just easier to have it zip tie? Or, and the time and the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Are you, are you asking um, what do I think specifically of computational design at the building scale? Uh, yes. That, that's sort of what you're asking? Yes. I, you know, I, the, Craig and I were trained um, very traditionally. Someone very influential in my own education was Rafael Moneo, who was my professor when I was in school, Spanish architect. And for Craig, Rum Koolhaas, he had Rum Koolhaas as a professor, very influential to both of us. And I think we come from a background, uh, especially Craig, who knows every building, he's an encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, 
from a background of precedent, actually. But how to think about precedent and uh, transform it, adapt it, not copy it, but how to adapt it with the site or new technologies. So for us, it really comes more from that side. I don't think we want to, we're not, our goals are not to create something that no one's ever seen before. That's not really what it is. It's more like, how can we tap into the lineage of architecture and a history of architecture and yet have it be new and fresh and have some innovation? Um, and that innovation could come with the way it's made, the type of material that's used, or just even spatially. Yeah. Gracias. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>